Our next esteemed guest is a neuroscientist by training and earns his living as a medical writer. In 2008, he published a novel, The Life and Death of Milan Yunak, in his native Montenegro, and in 2010 published translations of Charles Simic's poetry in Serbo-Croatian. His current project is a collection of stories in English and Serbo-Croatian. One, Whole Life, was published in the Kenyan Review Online, and one will appear in their spring 2014 issue. He lives in Evanston with his wife and their two sons. Please give a big hand to Vojslav Pejovic. Good. Thank you. I should probably leave at this point. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you guys for inviting me, and thanks for the lovely and perfect introduction. I said, yeah. Yeah. gloriously unmingled, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from one of the stories from that book that I, that was that was mentioned, and uh, I'm not going to give away too much. It's kind of a meandering story called Rearrangements. I'll just provide a little bit of the context. The action takes place mm -hmm. in Belgrade, Serbia, former Yugoslavia in fall of 1991, so at the outset of the wars that imploded Yugoslavia into seven countries. And uh, here we go. My birthplace is elsewhere. I used to call it with adolescent conviction, Macondo, or Buenos Aires. Over there, springs remain forever majestic, complicated, slightly nauseating. All summers are identical, too replete with unrequited loves on a windy beach, the climaxes of mirthful, crazy sorrows. You can tell the fall has come by the skin flaking of girls' shoulders, by suntan vanishing in patches from their faces, by yet another half-consumed love affair of mid-level schooling. And each winter is short, so short and incomplete that its only purpose seems to be in being sobering and forgettable. Once high school is over, the military service is due. A year-long excuse from reality filled with books, pitiful attempts at poetry, and extraordinary masturbatory efforts. <laughs> All manifestations of a boy's epic struggle with himself. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as the boy takes off his uniform, the war, a real one, begins. A good part of my freshman year I spent in the attic of a turn of the century building adjacent to the city's Philharmonic Orchestra Hall. My desiccated professor of vertebrate zoology, her face already resembling its own skull, her skeleton showing in great detail through the gauze of one's fashionable blouses, sits by an open window and strains her tiny voice, sometimes with passion, fighting back the orchestra in the midst of their tuning sessions and rehearsals. Her squeals for attention are either blasted away by the sounds of Brahms and Beethoven or muffled by the aromas of Capricciosa, Quattro Stagioni, Calzone, wafting through somewhere nearby straight into our minds, already clouded by the pungent memory of the formalin in which the overused specimens on our tables have been served. One day in early October, after a highly confusing lecture on circulatory systems, our hearts felt far less regulated than the lesson implied, I stepped for the first time into a narrow passageway between our building and the orchestra hall. That pizza place must be somewhere near, says my irritated nose, and sure enough, there's a door into the unknown, bearing the name of Verdi and the shiny, greasy logo, a musical clef melting into a steaming piece of dough. <laughs> the restaurant downstairs is spacious, an impression enhanced by the fact that only two of about two dozen tables are occupied, one by the entrance, by a young man finishing off his pizza and beer, and the next one by four musicians and their instruments, one cello, two violins, a horn in their tattered cases. Soft Yugoslav pop from the early 80s oozes from the speakers. Your beast loves you. Yes, he loves you. Sings a man with a bad cold. <laughs> and the air is thick with promise of a hot meal, reasonably priced. As I step in, no one looks in my direction, not even the two bald, thick-necked waiters at the bar, their eyes fixed upon something at their feet, their shiny foreheads almost touching. Small-time thugs released on probation, pronounces a voice in my head, and the thought, stirred up by anxieties of a freshman from the province and augmented by his formidable hunger, develops by itself. Pizzeria Verde is just a front for organized crime, a clearinghouse for ex-convicts, an establishment that matches patently inhospitable people with the hospitality industry. Not liking the place, but starving and cash-strapped, I hurry to a table that seems the least exposed to everyone's sight. A small window above my head rises up to a knee's height above the pavement outside, 
which allows for monitoring of the passing boots and skirted female thighs. This makes me forget for a while the hunger in the snake pit I entered. What do I want? Says the smaller and sturdier of the two in a subdued voice appearing from behind my back. A calzone and a Heineken, please, I reply in my best pleasant neutral tone, which is met with a probing silence. I bet he has no idea what calzone is. I eschew eye contact, lest I provoke uncorking of my throat with the bottle opener dangling from his apron. <laughs> it worked. He shuffled. he shuffles off to the bar, picks up a telephone, and relates something unintelligible to whoever is listening. After a long, silent look exchanged with his partner, he reaches for the bottle opener and starts scraping clean the undersides of his fingernails. I want to leave badly, but don't dare now that I ordered and got myself involved in a highly precarious situation. <laughs> so I go back to staring through the window and then shift my focus slowly to people in the room. My waiter's nowhere to be seen. The other one is busy flattening a few crumpled bills with his chunky fingers, which I bet acquired their distorted shape in fistfights and are kept strong and flexible by regular acts of strangulation. <laughs> You're laughing in all the right moments. <laughs> <laughs> the young man seated by the entrance does not seem scared, but rather exhausted beyond any measure. He counts his change slowly, leaves what has to be a very small tip, gets up as if burdened by a backpack filled with stones, and leaves his table limping. The musicians must be relieved that he's gone, because their conversation picks up in speed and volume almost instantly. Even so, I can hear only useless fragments from where I'm sitting, words like orchestra, or Norway, or France. They've got to be talking about their upcoming tour. Less plausibly, they could be playing a game of words containing letters R and A. <laughs> <laughs> Having figured that out, I find myself envying them profoundly. They're about to leave this basement of a country, or at least find out who has a superior vocabulary. <laughs> There's no purpose in bringing out the zoology textbook and pretending to read it. The unholy spirits of formalism could detach from its pages and ruin my disguise. My strategy is still based on remaining unnoticed. I stare at an empty plate with head in my hands, alternately faking headache and deep thinking. After a while, I give up, go to the musician's table, and ask if I could join them. Of course, says the youngest of the four, and moves his chair so I can squeeze in. The others nod in an in unconvincing agreement, exchanging looks that at least do not appear hostile. It turns out that my spying efforts were misguided. The words that had caught my ear were neither a game nor fragments of an itinerary. Norway is the country where more and more musicians from Belgrade to Cramonic Orchestra seek work, and France is where the town of Vézelay is. As the youngest of the quartet was just explaining, by the way, my name is David, he says en passant, the town has an abbey with apparently superb acoustics. Rostropovich himself chose it to record the cello suites by Bach after decades of searching. Do you know that music? David asks, looking me in the eyes, and all I can answer is that I'm familiar with both names. Pushed by an itching silence that follows my admission of ignorance, I offer an anecdote of mother bringing a bag full of LPs from her trip to Bari, Italy, and of her listening to one in particular, featuring Rostropovich, up until the Vilni ridges got barely readable. Which piece exactly do you remember, David asks again, which resurrects a long forgotten image of mother smiling, holding an LP sleeve in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other, a column of cigarette smoke smearing metallic gray hues over her natural pallor. The sleeve is light blue, with a black and white photo of the maestro emerging from the background, embracing his instrument as if about to abduct it into darkness or twist its neck in an act of passion. The cover announces in large white letters, Mastislav Rostropovich Interpreta, and then in yellow and somewhat smaller font, Dvorak, Concerto per Violoncello, Opus 104. I think the quartet, I thank the quartet for finding interest in my mother's taste, letting the image linger in my mind for a while, allowing silently to revisit it soon, and even shared that for me, the sad concerto has a moment so powerful and beautiful that I always thought of it as mind-blowing, long before I learned the word and started using it in conjunction with guitar solos of Jimi Hendrix and Mark Knopfler. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess, says David, picking up the cello from its case. After a few adjustments, the chair, the instrument, his lanky body, not paying attention to his older colleagues and their rolling eyeballs, he indeed plays the part I'm thinking of. The several bars that burst into an ascending scale executed at the speed of a fast and heavy inhale, only to dissolve into an eruption of the imagined orchestra. David plays it well, and the orchestra part actually starts booming in my head, not like a memory, but like a total physical evocation. I must have ended even tried to, to form the melody with my clumsy vocal cords, because David stops suddenly, and everyone is staring at me. The rush of blood into my cheeks does not prevent me from sensing that something hot is breathing by my ear. After a moment or two, the source of heat shifts, 
My waiter extends his pumped up arm and drops a round steaming calzone almost in my lap, saying, here, one for you. <laughs> hey buddy, why don't you play us some more, says the other waiter, carrying five beer bottles plugged in between, in between his mighty knuckles. <laughs> yeah, why don't you, echoes my waiter and slaps me on the shoulder as if offering fulfillment of a lifelong wish. <laughs> Driven by some kind of instinct reserved for policemen and bouncers, the two of them move side to side and lean on our table with their fists, revealing a jagged storyline of their forearms. Voluptuous women in polka dot bikinis, knives dripping pale blue blood, Three-headed snakes, their fangs moist with poison, boat anchors, and five-pointed stars, illegibly dated. Dali shoots me a smile, as if my life, not his, depends on pleasing our captors. This, my friends, he says, is by Johann Sebastian Bach, Sarabande from the cello suite number two, in D minor. As the great Rostropovich put it once, it's for those who've not said this. Cut the bullshit and play it, says my waiter. <laughs> yeah, says the other. David draws a long breath and on exhale, a dry and sweet hum full of longing permeates the room. The next day, both government and opposition outlets keep silent about two dangerous criminals being dissolved into non-existence in a downtown basement restaurant. Less surprisingly, there are also no accounts of David and me going to his studio nearby, starting and finishing a bottle of cheap red and making it to a jazz club afterwards, two blocks down the street, where more wine and some vodka is consumed. No surprise either that there's no mention of me waking up on David's floor, fully dressed, dragging my face across the carpet into the bathroom, where an urge to expel something viscous and purple through my facial orifices is relieved before I'm able to raise the toilet bowl. <laughs> and of course, everyone ignores the fact that I spend a long, long time cleaning up and resisting another gastrointestinal mayhem upon which I step out of the bathroom, refreshed and somewhat stabilized, with a small towel wrapped around my hips. <laughs> my pitiful bundle of clothes is jammed into a double garbage bag, and I can't decide whether its stench really expands beyond its PVC barrier, or if it all is just in my nostrils. <laughs> David is awake on an expandable sofa, stark naked, unable to peel away his bloodshot eyes from the TV. A town riddled with bullets and grenades is crumbling into its pixelated self as the announcer lists heroic achievements of the Yugoslav People's Army, whose brave and resourceful soldiers finally liberated the beautiful municipality of Vukovar. David pulls his knees up to his chin and starts rocking back and forth, releasing an incomprehensible sequence of murmurs and growls. Not able to get to him, I go through his chest without asking and change it to a pair of washed out jeans sized too tight for me and a shirt claiming the dead can dance. <laughs> Getting naked and dressed in the middle of his one-room abode, I realize with relief that his red eyes are now shut tightly. I did nothing wrong. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I keep saying to myself. Thank you. Well then, one more round of applause for West Side Show.